Good morning. Welcome to Revolution. Let's stand and worship together. Out of the desert, brought me into his dreams, river of living water. Turned my bitter into sweet, all my burdens were lifted. He took the shackles off my feet, but there's no sound louder than the captive set free. So, so let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so, sing of his promises. 
Lord, I confess And I'm far from innocent The shackles I wear I bought on my own Scarlet seas that a crimson cost I nailed my debt to that old rugged cross An empty grave, the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled I confess I've been a prodigal Made for your house But walked on my own And Jesus came And tore down these prison walls Death came to life when he called me by name. Scarlet sins had a crimson coast. He nailed my death to that old rugged cross. He emptied slate and the empty grave. Thank God that stone was born. Had a crimson cross He nailed my death to that old rugged cross He empty slate at the empty grave Thank God that stone was gold and robes draped over the ashes a wide open tomb where there should be a cask the children are singing and dancing and laughing the father is welcoming this is our homecoming roses in bloom pushed up from the embers rivers of tears flow from good times remember Families are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcome. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with the glorious sound. The great cloud of witnesses all gather round. The ones that were lost are finally found. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Scarlet sins had a crimson cross. You nailed my death to that old rugged cross. You empty slate at the empty grave. Think at that stone world.
majesty before my eyes I let it take my breath away yeah. and the angels fall face down on the floor all to echo holy is the Lord my heart can help but see with all of week is the beginning of the triumphal entry. We find it in uh, Matthew chapter 21, celebrating Palm Sunday today. Matthew writes, and when they had approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. And this took place in order that what was spoken through the prophet Zechariah would be fulfilled, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, a foal of a pack animal. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their garments on them. And he sat on the garments. And most of the crowd spread their garments in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the crowds going ahead, going ahead of him, and those who followed, they were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. It's the triumphal entry because it was the announcement of the Messiah who came to the world to save the lost. But the tragedy in Palm Sunday is what Jesus says to us in Luke 19 when he says, as he approached Jerusalem, he wept. He said, because you don't know the hour of my visitation. The people saw Jesus, they saw the Messiah coming into the city and they cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And just a short time later, they're yelling, crucify him. The tragedy in Palm Sunday is that they saw Jesus and they did not recognize him for who he was, the savior of the world. We have a wonderful opportunity this week to be in prayer for our loved ones people that would not come to church any other time of the year except for Easter and occasionally on a Christmas. So let's pray for those people as a church body this morning. Invite them. Wherever church they may want to darken a door to, just invite them to go, that they would hear and see the Messiah, that they would hear about Christ, and that they would recognize him as their Savior. Let's pray. Father, you have given us a wonderful opportunity the world is going to be celebrating this, this entry into the kingdom, Father, into Jerusalem. Lord, recognizing that this is the Passion Week, the week in which you'll be crucified for the sins of the world, and that people simply have to believe in their heart, confess in their mouth to be saved, and they will be saved. And so I'm praying for this body of believers this morning. Lord, if there are friends and family members that don't know you, maybe they've heard about you, God. Maybe they've seen you. Maybe they've come a, a bunch of different times and have yet to confess you as Lord, I, I pray for them this week, that they would come, Lord, that they would hear the gospel message, 
they would hear the good news of Jesus Christ, that they can be saved. They would see you, Lord, that they would recognize you, and it would be a joyous occasion which we will all celebrate as the angels in heaven are celebrating, that Jesus is Lord. We love you, Father. We give this service to you this morning. In the sweet name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please remember to keep the missionaries we support in your prayers. This is TJ Heights. He's a missionary with Mission of Hope. This is Jeremiah and April Markley, along with their kids, Jordan, Sarah, Judah, and Elena. They are missionaries with Ethnos 360 in Papua New Guinea. Good morning. How's everybody doing? There's three people that are happy to be here. The rest of you are enjoyed worship, I guess. So we are starting a new chapter in John this morning. We are closer to the end than the beginning of the book of John. So three years later, I will say there was a, a 10-week period where we uh, adjusted for COVID, so it's, it's COVID's fault that we aren't through John yet. I've, I've so enjoyed it. Um, you know, we joke sometimes about how long we're in a, in a book. We've only done this for two books. We did Galatians and obviously we're in John. And, and, and it does take time to, to plot your way through Scripture. Um, but from one book, we have seen so much of the Old Testament, so much of the New Testament. And, and I have to say, we have learned so much about our Lord. Uh, and our worship has been so much more informed and to me, one of the most obvious results of preaching the truth of Scripture was seen yesterday. Um, steadfast faith in light of a, a tragedy. Uh, a baby died during birth, and her parents exalted the name of the Lord. Uh, he was glorified all morning long. Um, we mourn with our brother and sister in Christ, uh, but we also rejoice that we know she is with her Savior. Um, so, thank God for His Word, because apart from Scripture, we would have nothing to stand on. We would be hoping in vain, uh, but He has given us His Word, and He's given us a record of who He is. Uh, we will talk next week of His resurrection, and we know what happened because we have His Word. Uh, so, I'm going to pray for us this morning and pray that He is continually glorified through the truth of Scripture, and by the Holy Spirit of God, we are continually sanctified by the preaching of it. If you guys would bow with me. Heavenly Father, Your love is overwhelming to give us a clear record of who You are, and Your kindness is overwhelming in Your Holy Word to tell us who we are relative to a holy God. We know we need a Savior because You've told us so. God, You are holy. You are righteous. And I pray, Lord, this morning that Your name is high and lifted up, that You are exalted in this place. Be glorified by the teaching of Your Word. Holy Spirit, would You come and breathe life on this holy word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful that you all have come this morning. I do love this time of year, as Pastor Jason said, next week is Easter. Um, for, for pastors probably across the world, it is a stressful time because wrongfully so, it is a Sunday emphasized above others. Every time we come together and gather, it is in the name of Christ, our Savior. He is what we have in common. So every Sunday is separate 
is holy. It is no less holy than Easter, but I agree with Pastor Jason that many who do not come to church otherwise will come on Sunday. So I would echo his request that we pray for those people that will be here. We pray that the Spirit of God does a work that only He can supernaturally do, that He gives them a heart of flesh, that He gives them ears to hear and eyes to see, that they would hear the proclamation of the truth and they would believe it, that they might be saved, right? It is interesting, though, we're going to look at chapter 18 this morning and just the arrogance and just dumbfounding blindness of disbelief that occurs in the face of God, the living God. Not taking my word for it, but people standing in front of Him refusing to believe that He is who He says He is, even after everything He's done. And and this instance that we read about in chapter 18 is astonishing to me. It is a, it is a unique scenario, um, really bizarre. Uh, so we'll get into it, but uh, just to, to, to remind us where we've been, we're coming out of one of the most unique records uh, in all of Holy Scripture in John 17. Uh, we see here our Lord praying for us on our behalf. We see Him in the office of, of our great high priest, um, he prays for those that the Father has given him out of the world. And earlier in the evening, remember, all of this has taken place on Thursday night into Friday morning. And earlier in the evening, he dismissed Judas, who was the son of perdition. We need to be careful not to make Judas some sort of martyr in this scenario. Uh, he has been the son of perdition since before the foundation of the earth. But he chose to not believe in Christ, Uh, and he bears the weight of that decision. He is the archetypal hypocrite. There is none more disgusting in terms of unbelief than Judas, and he certainly died the death he deserves, and I I, I don't say that from a place of judgment uh, because it's by the grace of God in Christ that I believe in the God that he walked with, but he betrayed the only innocent man who has ever lived. So he dismisses him earlier in the evening, and upon his dismissal, the Word says that Satan entered him. Uh, And then our Lord goes on to intimately share with the eleven that remain the heavenly resources they will uh, have to build his church, as well as the hatred the world will have for them. Um, And then this Thursday night comes to an end again with a glimpse of the uh, much more ministry, as Paul says, of our Lord. Uh, Again, that is to say that he, He died in hours, He raised to life in days, but Paul says, or the writer of Hebrews, that He ever lives to make intercession for those that the Lord has given Him out of this world Uh, It is Christ alone that upholds our salvation, and I I thank the Lord for that. Um, If I could lose it, I would. If it was up to me to maintain it, I would lose it. Uh, But because He upholds my salvation, I am in His hand, and His hand is in the Father's. I cannot be lost if I am hidden in Christ. Uh, So now we've come to the early hours of Friday morning. It is dark outside. It is a dark time altogether. And we start here in John 18, verse 1 through 11. I'll read that to us this morning. When Jesus had spoken these words, He went forth with, with His disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which He entered with His disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying Him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with His disciples. Judas, then having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with him. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. 
Therefore he again asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I lost not one. Simon Peter, then having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? So up until this night, we've said this before, but uh, our Lord's hour had not yet come. We see that often throughout the book of John. Uh, They tried to seize Him, and He says, My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. And on this night, He has said many times, His hour has come. Most recently, John 17, 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify the Son so that the Son may glorify You. This is His appointed hour, and He will die a horrendous death at the hands of evil men. He will drink the cup of the wrath of God, taking the full weight of the punishment for the sins of the world and becoming a curse on our behalf. But here in John's Record, John, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, wants us to know that our Lord is no victim. Right? He says, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to pick it up again. Our Lord is God. He is not a victim. And the glory of our Lord is on display in these events more so than anything John has recorded thus far. We know that Christ, as God, was in control of every circumstance and every person involved in those circumstances at all times. We remember uh, the Lord saying in uh, John 2, He knew what was in the hearts of men. Uh, He he is in control of every circumstance and every situation. But so much greater than all the miracles John has recorded up to this point, just To quickly remember, greater than turning water into wine, greater than meeting an outcast Samaritan woman at a well to give her eternal life, and then giving her whole town eternal life, greater than a lame man walking or a blind man being made to see because God creates new eyes for him uh, out of dirt, greater than the Lord knowing what was in the hearts of men, greater uh, even that, that... Jesus calling a four-day dead Lazarus out of a grave. Greater than all of those things is what we will see in this text. Jesus allows Himself to be arrested, unjustly tried, and He will give His life as a ransom for many. This is the most glorious thing that the Lord has done. In one sense, this hour is the worst hour And in another sense, this hour is the most glorious of our Lord's and all of mankind. This is, again, a dark setting. It is the early hours of Friday morning. It is dark outside. And Judas is the the height of, of hypocrites. He is coming to betray the Lord under the direction of his sinful heart and the possession of the devil. This is a dark time. And in the midst of this darkness... John shows us our Lord's glory. We're going to see that manifested in four different ways in these 11 verses. First, we'll see His divine resolve. We'll see His divine power, His divine love, and His divine righteousness. John 18.1 and 18.4 tell us that knowing these things, the Lord went forth. Jesus went forth. This is His divine resolve. He moves to His own death. He does it without hesitation. He is supernaturally courageous. He knows exactly what is coming. And it's important that we understand this is beyond a physical death, right? Martyrs throughout history have died for the truth, for the sake of the gospel. It is noble, um, and it is, it is worthy of, of mention. It is a, a worthy testimony uh, for the, the gospel. It's a life worthy of the gospel of Christ, as Paul says. Um, But our Lord's death is different. Uh, He is going to absorb all the wrath of God to the end that 
the Lord God in the flesh will become separated from His Father. Sin will separate a holy God and He will be separated as a curse. It's important that we understand that no man could do this. And if one tried, it would be in vain because no matter how good they are, they would die a death they deserve. Only one innocent man has ever died on this planet, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus goes to the cross with divine resolve. So we read 18.1. When Jesus had spoken these words, He went forth with His disciples over the ravine of the Kidron where there was a garden in which He entered with His disciples. He went forth over the ravine of the Kidron where there was a garden. We know from the other Gospels this was the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew what was going to happen there. John 18.4, Jesus, knowing all things that were coming upon Him, went forth. The ravine of the Kidron, this is a a valley with a a stream running through it. And I believe John, again, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, is mentioning this because it's it's extremely symbolic. Um, This is the Passover, and the temple where the Passover lambs were being slaughtered was above this ravine. And as the lambs were slaughtered, the blood would run down the altar behind the temple into the Kidron Valley. What a good day for children to be in here. <laughs> we're going to talk about slaughtering lambs. So There's a lot of blood. Uh, this valley would be bright red with blood. We don't know uh, how many lambs were sacrificed at this Passover, but there is a, a record in church history 30 years after this one and, and there's a census that recorded the number of lambs slaughtered. There's 256,000 lambs slaughtered. And the Lord is walking through this valley, and you can imagine how much blood was coming from behind the temple. And here we read, "...the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world to take away the sins of the world steps over the stream of blood of lambs that cannot take away sin." And he goes to offer himself as the only sacrifice that can. So crossing the Kidron, he goes up to the garden. He goes there because he's gone there many times. He and his disciples together. He goes there because Judas has been there with him many times. If we look at verse 2, chapter 18, verse 2. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. He goes there because he knows this is where Judas will come to betray him. John wants us to know that Jesus went there because he knew that is where Judas would come to betray him. He is no victim. He moved to his betrayal. He moved to his own execution. He is in complete control, and with divine resolve, he moves towards his sacrifice. And he takes his eleven with him. Takes him with them so that they would know he was not seized as a helpless victim, but that he voluntarily gave up his life. So we pick it up in verse 3. Jesus is now in the garden. And here comes Judas. Judas, then having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests, and the Pharisees came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. This is interesting to me. This is, uh, this is an astounding scene. I'm going to do my best to, to illustrate this. A Roman cohort is 600 soldiers. So they have compiled 600 Roman soldiers, and this cohort had a commander. So we know this was a, this was a, a high alert situation. And John tells us that beyond that, there were officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. So we have 600 Roman soldiers, probably a few hundred officers. And and you have to think, most likely, as this mass moved through the night on their way to the garden, that they accumulated people watching. So we have anywhere from 800 to 1,000 people, potentially, in this little garden to witness the arrest of Christ They're also heavily armed. The the word says they had weapons and torches. Why would 
that be the case. If we remember earlier in the week, Jesus by Himself clears the temple. There wasn't 50 people in the temple. There was a couple hundred thousand people in the temple, and no one stopped Him. He supernaturally cleared the entire temple. So these people are afraid. They have a a rightful fear of the living God, even though they refuse to acknowledge that that is who He is. So here then, Jesus is confronted by 600 Roman soldiers and a few hundred others. And then He speaks in verse 4. Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon Him, went forth. He starts the conversation Whom do you seek? We see their answer in verses 5 and 6. They answered Him, Jesus, the Nazarene. And He said to them, I am He. And Judas also, who was betraying Him, was standing with them. We've seen His divine resolve, and now we see His divine power. It's important to note that Judas is the only name mentioned here as if he's the only one there. This is his betrayal. He owns it alone. His is a deep guilt because he walked with Christ. He saw everything he did. He heard everything he said. And he rejected him as the Son of God. And the only other name here is Malchus. He's a slave of the high priest. And the only reason he is there, the only reason Malchus is present is so Peter could cut off his ear and the Lord could do one more miracle that would encourage the faith of those who believed in Him and it would greater condemn those who don't. This scene is, again, so bizarre. But it speaks to the utter depravity and, and willful blindness of unbelief. Close to a thousand people witnessed Jesus put a man's ear back on and they continue with His arrest. And they're so foolish in His midst with their torches and spears that after He declares He is, which is to say, I am the I am. He's saying, I am God. And the proclamation that He makes causes them to fall down. You have a thousand people knocked to their backs in the presence of a holy God. And they blindfully and willfully, ignorantly stand up to proceed in their arrest. (laughs) He is no victim. He has complete control over all of them and all things and With one word they fall, like twigs in the midst of a tornado. They simply cannot stand in His presence. They fell helpless at His feet. So there is His divine resolve, His divine power, and we see now His divine love. If we look at verse 7 and 8, Therefore He again asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am He, so if you seek Me, let these go their way. Why does the Lord ask this again? He wants them to state who they are there for. It's a formal declaration, we're here for you. So He's saying, if you're here for Me, then let these go. You're not here for them. And the question was asked to fulfill the word he had spoken earlier. We see that in uh, verse 9. To fulfill the word which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I lost not one. He does not allow the disciples to be arrested and, uh, and brought to trial and judgment. He does not allow them to be treated as he is going to be treated. He protects them from that so that none of them would be lost. If they had been arrested and tried at this point, if they had been treated as Christ was after this, their faith may have waned and they wouldn't be able to stand with resolve, the resolve necessary to preach the gospel to a lost and dying world, a world that would hate them. So here in the garden, He keeps them from 
harm, and he fulfills his word that none of them would be lost. He upholds his word, and, and he upholds their faith by keeping them from something they could not bear at that time. Our Lord is our great high priest, and out of love he protects his sheep. It is true when he says, I will give them nothing that they can't bear. There is no temptation that we cannot bear. How is that possible? Because our Lord is bearing it on our behalf. Whether I stumble or not does not dictate my salvation. Again, if I could lose it, I would. I'm saved because he says I am saved. And he has actively saved me. There's nothing I can do to save myself. The reason we get to heaven is not because God says it, it's because he sees to it. He is actively upholding my salvation. A true believer cannot be lost because Jesus will pray them into heaven. That is what He is doing even now. Again, this is the much more ministry of Christ. And this was exceptionally comforting yesterday. I know we've talked about this a couple of times. And truthfully, all I can say, it was, it was one of the most glorious displays of, of the grace of God that I've seen that I've been alive to witness. A father standing over a casket this big should not ever happen. And, and please don't hear me the wrong way when I say this. Our sovereign God does everything for our good and for His glory. Vivian Hope Christ through her accomplished things that could have never been accomplished otherwise. She is with her God. She is not lost. And her parents are closer to God than they would have been otherwise. It is for their good and it is for His glory. And I don't take anything away from the deep pain that they will feel until they are reunited with the Lord and they get to see her daughter, their daughter in heaven. So don't misunderstand me. But the Lord does things that we would never choose to do to accomplish results that only He could accomplish through those things. Right? He is altogether good and sovereign. And His glory was on great display. In that instance, it was exceptionally comforting. We mourned with our brother and sister over the death of their baby girl but we know by the power and ministry of Christ that she is present with her Savior in a place that He has created for her. It is His divine resolve, His divine power, and His divine love. And, and, and now we see His divine righteousness. And this, it's all good. <laughs> but I didn't see this coming. As the worship team comes back up, John 18, 10, and 11. Simon Peter, then having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Peter, certainly out of love, pulls this sword. Right? He's going to fight his way out of there. Uh, he loves his Lord. This behavior from Peter is not new. If we remember Matthew's Gospel when uh, the Lord tells his disciples he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die, and Peter begins to rebuke him and say, Far be it from me, Lord. I'm not going to allow you to die. And the Lord's response is, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. We are so often like Peter, often thinking our Lord needs our help, and that we must fight on His behalf. He does not call us to help, He calls us to obey. He will build His church, we just obey. So Peter cuts off Malchus's ear. Jesus picks it up and puts it back on. And again, I'm shocked that they didn't fall back down and worship at the feet of the living God. And 
So he says, Peter, put the sword in the sheath. He says something else to Peter in Matthew's account, Matthew 26, 52. And Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. What is he speaking to? Ten Commandments, right? If you, if you give a life, or if you take a life, you give a life at its place. You are guilty. And the punishment is death. So we see here the divine righteousness of Christ in upholding the law on Peter's behalf. He's saying, Peter, if you take a man's life according to God's law, they would just be wanting to take yours, and they would be just in doing that. So Jesus is upholding God's righteous law in saving Malchus. He is also saving Peter. Peter is trying to stop Christ from giving his life, and he is saving Peter's. Jesus upheld the law in every aspect, and he fulfilled it on our behalf. He goes on, The cup which my Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Saying, That is what I came to do, Peter. I am no victim. I am giving my life unto the glory of God. And he did. And next week we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. We will break away from John 18 and the gospel will be proclaimed. And I would encourage you again to invite anyone that may come. It is a day that most don't attend, or it is a day that most who normally don't attend will attend. And not to say that that would change after coming to our church. But they will hear about the resurrection of the living God. And they will be confronted with the gospel of Christ. We often quote Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. So we're going to preach his word and we will pray that, that our miracle working God will give ears to those who come so they can hear. And he will grant them faith to believe. Right? Pray for that this week. Invite family. They may be a little more receptive than they'd normally be. So let's stand and let's worship our Lord together one more time. Still